Hello and welcome to Unclog with our Broco Doctor. And today we're going to be discussing ADHD. Statistically, affecting 5-8% to of the population. And so you watching this will most likely meet someone with ADHD, fall in love with them, or even give birth to them. And you're going to have certain questions in your mind. And to answer those questions and to let us in into what it's like living with ADHD, we have with us today, Jude Abaga, also known as the guy, <laughs> <laughs> and Enyola Mafe Abaga. Thank you very much for doing this, for being on this conversation with us. So let's get straight into it. What is it like living with ADHD? Yeah, maybe. Should I start? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the one thing about people getting diagnosed or thinking they may have ADHD um, is the realization that it's not like a it's not like a cancer prognosis. It's not this thing that you can cut out. It's actually who you are. It's it's ingrained into your how you think, how you see the world, how you accept the world, how you accept rejection, how you everything. So there's a lot of like what they call comorbidities alongside it. I don't like that term, but it is what they use. But I think it was for me realizing that all the things that didn't seem to make sense about me, that I couldn't quite explain to people why at the same time I could be highly interested in the chair that you're sitting in, yet not even listen to a word of what you're saying. And, but also be an, a straight A student who was accomplishing a lot in life. There was a lot in my story that didn't seem to make sense, but almost when I got diagnosed with ADHD and they told me what my propensity was, which when is, was this? I was 19 years old. Um, I, this was now I, 20, almost 20 years ago, um, or oh, 15 years ago, sorry, my math is not great. Um, but, but yeah, it would just help to fit. It was like suddenly someone get, told me how the rubrics cube should be put together and it started making sense. And now I could explain myself to people a little bit better with a lens of understanding myself within this, within an ADHD frame. Have you ever had someone tell you that it's just, just, just to put your thoughts together? Mm -hmm. you, have you, have you, because a lot of people actually think that ADHD is a problem of willpower. Mm -hmm. So when you say ADHD, no, just if you can force yourself to actually pay attention, you will pay attention. That's the mindset of quite a number of people. Of course, we know it's not, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a disorder in the brain mm -hmm. and understanding that will help you understand ADHD. But I want to know from your own experience, mm -hmm. has anyone ever told you, you know, yeah. that it's just, just pay attention and, and you probably do a lot of things better. Um, my entire report cards from age six to 18 from school were she is she is very smart, but she seems scatterbrained. She can't hand in her work, but when she does, it's phenomenal. It's top of the class, but it was late by a week or she didn't listen or she's being disruptive or all of those things. What happens, and it's really cool to, for, for both um, Em and I to talk is that in women, we're able to mask it very early on. You don't see a lot of women getting diagnosed, girls getting diagnosed with ADHD, and there's real scientific and yeah. also societal reasons for that. Because the image we have of ADHD is kids running around, slamming their bodies into things and scattering places and being highly disruptive. But and we for most, that, that, that those particular characters and, and that extreme is what it is and that's and many times it presents in boys because they are just generally more um physical than women and also you've also got to know that as women very early on as a girl you're told how you're supposed to act mm -hmm. and if you act this way if you keep your legs crossed if you talk when you're supposed to be talk talked to we kind of girls with adhd with this disorder learnt very early that it's important to mask that behavior because it's not becoming of a lady or it's not becoming of someone who should be smart or a girl. And so we were conditioned very early on. It's not because we didn't deal with the same issues as our male counterparts, but it presents differently. It also means that you, unlike, I'm actually a, um, an anomaly in terms of being diagnosed as early as I was, especially as a black woman um, at 19. 
because most, and also for socioeconomic reasons, I was able to go to schools that were able to do those tests. But for most women, they're not diagnosed till they have a, a breakdown, till a divorce or some, some big thing happens in their life where they realize that they can't cope. Uh, women get uh, diagnosed no. with ADHD during motherhood because it brings out a lot of the need for structure, which they don't necessarily have innately. Um, but it's not that they can't, can't express themselves. It's just that I think with women, especially, and I'd love to hear from Em about how it is for, for men, but um, there is a little bit of a difference when it, when it um, exhibits itself in, in society and how we deal with it. Thank you. Yeah, so um, the gay, <laughs> the gay. Um, as, first off, as a man, what is what has it been like? You know, I, I was going to ask from two perspectives. You know, there's you being a man, and there's also you being creative. But um, I think you could mention some too, please. But yeah. what is what what has it been like? What were your first experiences with ADHD? Yeah, um, you know, I really like listening to Anila talk about it. I think she has better language um, and maybe a better experience to share. And I say this because for me, what my childhood was, was I just loved music. I loved ideas, I loved books, I loved, you know, I didn't, it was tough for me to read in class, but probably because I wasn't like paying attention, you know, and, um, and if I was really interested in something in the arts, I would excel really well, my schoolwork was suffering. Um, but I also like had parents that were like, my dad is a pastor, you know, so they weren't like, you must excel. They were just like, you know, sort of easy. And so even though by the time I went to college, I figured out that the ADD they were talking about, you know, oh, I, oh yeah, this is me. But still I never like connected the, the two dots. And I think the first time that I really got a sense of like how much of it controls, uh, it can control a person was in our relationship. Yeah. When any would explain, you know, use terminology that she'd learned um and i googled it and i will say that the first thing i saw was that life for people with adhd that was on wikipedia can be difficult and i remember that it was like like almost like a weight off my shoulder i was like oh okay i can look back at some of those things differently now and understand that it's part it was always going to be part of my journey in life to struggle with because of when I was born, because of where I was born, to struggle with those things, and it's okay, you know. Um, so maybe that's my experience. Um, to me, it's both the thing that has given me so much, because it's where I go to to like create, mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, um, it's the part of me that I want to understand the most because I, I. Um, feel like talking about like conversations like this can can be powerful mm. um, in terms of making the lives of other people that may have the same thing better. I don't want to say we don't have the resources mm. to be able to make we that don't. happen. But, like, you know, <laughs> we, but don't. We, we don't we don't have the resources to make that happen. Mm. And there are quite a number of kids who are suffering because rather than get um, bespoke education, you know, yeah. kind of learning, they're being forced to learn the same way that other kids are learning. Mm. And when they don't fit into that particular box or mm. criteria, they've been told, well, oh, you're not doing well, you're not mm. paying attention. Or oh, if you would just pay attention. Mm. Outside that, right, um, ADHD can also affect relationships. Mm. I'd like to think so. Yeah. And um, from my discussions with other people, one of the things, oh, you're just not paying attention to me. You're not listening. You know, you could say something really important to your partner who's living with ADHD and that person just zooms somewhere, and, you know, mm -hmm. in, in your mind. Have you ever had that experience? <laughs> Have we ever had that experience? What are you talking about? This is what? the first time I'm... What? <laughs> all the time. When? Yeah. Every day. Like, this morning, probably. Oh. Every day. Did it, did, it, did it affect your relationships positively or negatively? Hmm. And at what point did you understand? Gosh, there's so many levels to this, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Answer. I want to hear your answer. Okay. <laughs> I mean, fundamentally, ADHD is how your brain, how my brain works, whether I know it or not. So it has 
a propensity to go to things that are um, maybe more short term because I'm getting dopamine, I'm getting like serotonin, like I'm getting like a, a high from seeing a bright color or, um, or something that gives me a me social media can give me immediate like dopamine. So when you're telling me that there's a relationship that I could be in for 40 years and, and for the rest of my life that I have to, I'm not gonna get the benefits of it immediately on one day, but I have to work towards this goal that I don't always, I'm not always, you're not always gonna get dopamine from your relationships, right? Mm -hmm. That other person is struggling, that other person has needs at a time when your listening power is going down, you're gonna have to like will yourself. So in a normal relationship, you can cut out the white noise with a neurotypical brain. Right. You can cut out the white noise. You can say, I need to focus on my partner's ex, some, whatever it is happening to them at this point in time, they've asked me to listen. And that means I have to act in this kind of way. So my brain, when that same thing would happen is it depends if I have my phone near me, if I've just had a, a, a quick phone call, if I haven't been to the gym and therefore it hasn't given me my fix somewhere else, if I'm in a very low um, energy mode where I myself have anxiety and I'm, you know, I'm trying to like build up my own energy and stimulus to do things in the morning. Um, and then my husband comes to talk to me about something it's a very different, he's fighting against multiple different, like there's a massive orchestra and a mariachi band playing right behind me in my ears. And he's telling me something important. And it's not because that thing isn't important, it's because he has to fight through all of the noise that is both in my head, what I'm doing, how I'm responding, my emotional regulate, my, my emotional response to him and all of those things. So imagine a conductor managing an orchestra where everyone has different sheet music mm -hmm. and and then you still have to be present in your relationship so it makes it for it's not about love it's not about willpower it's not any of those things it's about building the habits and also communicating and understanding where in your day where in my day where in my mindset i can be the best version of myself for my partner for whatever they need now if you add having two people with adhd exactly. i think who have a lot of love for each other you now have three orchestras 25 sheet music and like someone wants to do rap and someone wants to do like classical music and you're now trying to and someone has told you guys please make a song out of this because that's essentially what our conversations are. It's developing something that we can both align to and communicate and engage with each other. So it is hard. It's not impossible, but it requires a, a sense of determination, even if you fail. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I fail every day at like being a great wife, but I also have to know that like, I have 40 years to do this. <laughs> no, I mean, but what I happens also, after 40 years? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I have, I have someone who I mean, is years fundamentally is enough. Is enough. Forty years is enough, is enough. for any couple. Is enough. If you get there, you know. pressure is getting worse. <laughs> um, but I like not that, but also like that that this person has chosen me, and it gives me a little bit of like feeling of like someone day my back. Like they, they are annoyed with me. They're frustrated with me because I can't listen at that point in time. But like they know I could do better. So that helps a little bit. That helps. But it still requires the individual having a determination to, like for me, to be like, I know this doesn't feel right. Or this, this person, I may feel very hurt and, um, and shamed by what they're saying, which is like, you're not listening, you don't, you don't care. But really what it is, is like, I'm not exhibiting behavior that tells them that I'm right there with them. And I have to be okay, Any, what can you do to ensure that this, what you want is happening in real time? So it is hard. It's very, 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 very hard. 
But also it does help when the other person has ADHD in a way there's like a strange bedfellow approach, which is that he kind of knows, kind of even though he wants to hold me to a high account, he kind of knows that like, yeah, she's gonna mess up. And there's something kind of okay about that. Hmm. I think. We'll see what, <laughs> what Jude says about it. What do, what do you? Yeah, again, as I told you, like when Andy talks about this, honestly, I, I, I just listen. And maybe I try to say like, what could I add? Like maybe a different perspective. Okay, so um, we're gonna start with him next time. Different, different perspective. Um, yeah, just to add to say, first of all, I think Eni and I both had to have a conversation about the fact that when we had presented the facts that we're both ADHD, we both had to like take a breath and be like, this is not gonna be easy because it's not easy, you know? Um, I think that some things that come along with like ADHD that we don't talk about are like the propensity to feel more deeply. Feel everything. Yeah, to feel more hurt if your partner does something to you, to feel more offended, you know, those kind of things. So it making it work, I mean, oh, okay. I though, however, speaking to other people i think that also relationships are just a difficult thing yeah. it's just a difficult thing to crack so the thing i wanted to add is that when i started listening to any i discovered that there are things you can do and i started doing yoga a little bit and it improved my attention measurably mm -hmm. i started to pay attention to myself and i I'm, i mean any will probably have a better ex a better estimate of how I'm doing. But I think like I was able to move notches wise on the emotional regulation front where instead of like where I would feel something, I can now be like, oh, I'm having that feeling again and I can stop and I can observe myself, you know? So it's not to say that, it's not to say that the human experience of having a brain that sort of is like, whatever you you know what I mean that is not difficult it's just to say that that I think that these conversations properly done will equip can equip people mm -hmm. like you shouldn't listen to this an ADHD person and drop your shoulders yeah. because talking about it understanding more can equip you to greatly improve how you interact with the world you know what I'm saying and that's been part of my experience you know um over the last two years because now I have more equipment you know now I can we follow pages on social media we, I read books about it I read you know watch YouTube videos about it try to understand more about the brain and then I'm like oh okay I can see I'm in the loop again mm -hmm. so like I, f I find out now that my brain puts me in loops um, let me let me think of one um, if I have an idea my my brain always says, get it, gather everyone. So I'm always like, let's have a meeting, right? But it's a loop and sometimes the meeting is not necessary. So now I can observe myself and then I can ask myself, is this just your brain doing the thing? Or are you, do you, is this meeting a, a, an integral part of what the next step needs to be? And I feel like, Again, I, I say this to people that are listening that, that may, may be going, wait, am I ADHD? Is my life going to be difficult? Is my partner ADHD? Is our relationship going to be? It's like, no, the more you know, the more equipped you are, the more you can, um, I, I believe, at least has been my experience. And I want to say that respectfully because I know everybody's different. I, yeah, I even feel yes, between any yes. and I, there's a, there's a disparity. I think that there's things I can recognize that we experience the same, and there's so many things that we rec I recognize that are different. So I hope something in there was useful yeah, yeah. from what I, I shared. You so. know. I, I think Annie had the... No, you <laughs> the, no yeah. I, I think, I think um, perspectives are different, mm -hmm. and perspectives are important. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons we're having this conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the more perspectives we have, the better people who are out there living with these conditions can relate and understand mm -hmm. and find help and mm -hmm. get help. Um, which brings me to my next question because something you said triggered something in my brain. Yeah. And um, did you ever find yourself dealing with perfectionism? You know, and I ask why. 
come to you and no 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 <laughs> i just i love but, this question you know because a lot of times people with adhd have been shamed you know uh, you're not doing it properly and so when they do for, you know do something they want to do it to the very best oh that's you very know, interesting just i've just never made that link in my life oh wow just to be able to prove that i can do something and do it well so oh, wow. if you ever find yourself battle with being a perfectionist that's such a great question because it's made me think of a link that i never had thought about before but yes, I do. I mean, it's clear, it's obvious if you're an MI fan. <laughs> what happened to all the videos? <laughs> and that's what happened. Why why did the albums come out late? Why doesn't he keep his release dates? It's mm. that's it. It's ADHD. Mm. It's me. It's 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 the scaled out version of that. It's me over obsessing over details. Um, again, I say it's those loops. Like, if I think of an idea, my brain tells me you need to start working on the pieces of this idea. And now at this stage in my life, I realize that no, I need to, <laughs> I need to scale out what will the success look like in six months, and then say what are, what is the most important thing I can do, and then do that and delegate everything else. But I have to remind myself that every time I have a new idea, do you understand? Because my brain is not going to do that for me. I have to. It's almost like having a tattoo somewhere, right? So, um, it's been there my whole career. It's been there, um, and and I, I'm glad you made that link because again, I'm I'm sure. I mean, my early childhood, I don't remember having that those interactions. I I feel like maybe I'll think about it more, but I feel like I was very supportive with my ideas and creativity. And I would like to add one more thing. I think that the creative industry has a lot of neurodiverse people, and I find that one of the biggest holds that stops people from evolving is this idea around perfectionism. You know what I mean? And it's something that, again, I personally, like, we're talking about the guy, right? The guy is like this avatar, nameless, faceless avatar that I'm using to replace, let's say, Mr. Incredible, the chairman, to move forward. Because sometimes you create this idea that becomes, you, you're working on making it perfect. Mm. And, by the, and you never get there, and it traps you. You stay obsessed about this idea of yourself or your idea of your career or idea of who you should be. And you keep chipping away at it that if it's just perfect, people will, people will love me or people will accept me or whatever. And in the real world, sometimes the real world calls for you to abandon that idea. That idea is no longer relevant. Actually, this idea would be better. You know what I'm saying? And you have to, again, it's like this thing about. So I, I say that like when I, when I, when I share on this topic, because again, I haven't been diagnosed. I don't have as much. I'm, I, I'm glad to pass the mic to Enyola now, you know, because I think between in the conversation, but but I, I just always want to share to people that as you listen and you hear the like all the stuff you guys are talking about, the, the, the hormones behind that, you know, the serotonin and dopamine and all the stuff that people don't, people don't go like, oh, you know, as they figure it out, but that they're like, this is an opportunity for me to be curious about maybe what's going on in my brain because if I am educated, maybe I can make I can make some adjustments that can make me way more, you know, productive. Or, you know. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. Amy, yeah. perfection is gosh, it's so it's so cool hearing my husband talk about these things because I think I'll I'll, I'll explain why because I start I I was born a perfectionist. Um, I probably have like a family dynamic that required that to be the case um, highly educated parents somewhat privileged enough to be educated all over the world my mom is like experiments tries everything does everything dad like you could basically they told me you can do anything not even like whether you're a girl or boy like just do anything you want to be janitor be it be the best janitor in the world and start the best janitorial business whatever it is do it which is fantastic but it's also, I realize, was a very tough thing for someone who has ADHD to actually be told, you can do anything. Therefore, I could do anything. Mm. And I tried everything. <laughs> like, there's nothing I have not tried. And then tried to be perfect at everything. And instead of, and so no one ever told me really no, per se, in my family. But they were like, but be the best. And I realize now, telling, a high functioning person with ADHD who has like perfection issues 
and anxiety about failure probably wasn't the best combination of things, but it's also made me the person I am, which I'm very proud of. So as, as Jude said, it's like a, ADHD is like a friend, a long time friend for me that sometimes acts up and is annoying and frustrating, but also is like a really source of, of strength and creativity and stuff. So I have a weird relationship with ADHD in the sense that I really, it's made me who I am, but I'm also like mindful of those things. Perfectionism for me is something that I definitely dealt with very, very heavily. It made me depressed. It made me have high levels of anxiety. I was always put in places or put myself in places where excellence was needed. I would go to the top schools or the top ballet or the, you know, it was what my parents want. Oh, if you're gonna go horse riding, let's go to the best schools. But I realized through that, it was like, it's either the best or nothing. Mm. And so it was a series of things that got me out of the perfectionist um, drain because perfectionism means that you can't just sometimes sit down and just enjoy your wins. It means you can't take the time to be in rest, which is very important for people with ADHD because you cannot keep your mind going. So many times in my life, and I was just talking to my therapist about it, I'd had times where my body and my brain had broken down. And then I'd pick it back up and then I'd run it like a, like a well-oiled machine and then it would break down again. And I realized probably meeting Jude, who has a very different flow and cycle to his life by virtue of his work and also who he is as a person. Um, he's more calmer than me um, and, and finds spaces for rest in different ways and, and to do, to, to, because he has to, because all his creativity, all those 11 albums and, and massive shows and everything ha has come from him. So he's kind of like, he has to take care of the machine in a sense. Yeah, um, and so watching him and learning from him and understanding um, that perfectionism, even though he says he is a perfectionist, which he is, it was what attracted me to him. He's just, he's excellent, right? But at the same time, the way in which he's excellent is through a very authentic way of like knowing himself and, and, and learning and evolving. And I really was attracted to that. I don't think that I would have, he's, he was perfect for me in terms of dating because we could vibe off of each other and also give each other grace when we weren't perfect. I really hope that the people who are watching, you know, um, do get help, right? Yeah. Because it, it's, it, it helps with giving a sense of direction. Oh, just like um, M.I. said, that for a long time you could be doing something and then all of a sudden there's this ray of light and be like oh so this is why i have been like this all this while <laughs> and knowing that and being armed with that information you could go on to do better things we are living in a fast-paced world with everything happening at the same time and that alone could be a lot of pressure for any normal any neurotypical brain let alone someone who is living with adhd it's, you know divergent so how do you cope? I know you mentioned yoga, but I'm pretty sure there are other ways. An ADHD person has a lot, but you can still make a decision on what to focus on. It's more difficult because there are more things distracting you, but you can still make a decision. And so to make the decision easier, what you can do is you can move some things to the background. Okay. So what I'm trying to do now in my life is to move things like, for instance, picking out outfits or deciding what to eat because I can be in a loop for an hour and a half. Do you know what I'm saying? Just deciding what to eat. Just deciding what to eat. And I think that spending time doing body scans, spending time meditating, thinking back and reflecting back on your day, understanding why that person that you shrugged off, like um, didn't call you back or things like that. Sometimes with people with ADHD, we are present yet. We are emotionally present but not like present um, to, to, with our full selves. And so you always have to do a check. Um, other coping strategies is talking, talk therapy or talking to others who have either going through ADHD, have ADHD or have conquered it. I think in many ways it was really great for both of us because I had experienced and gone through CBT, DBT, every single possible 
thing for ADHD I have tested, which is why I actually want to do more work around and build out and building out a platform around neurodiversity in the African continent um, and want to talk more with people. Um, learning from someone who was going through it and experiencing through Jude's eyes was also really interesting. So having those conversations where how does your ADHD, how's your, how is your ADHD doing? And having conversations with other people who have ADHD. Um, finding a coach, finding a therapist, finding help to help guide. Um, it could be someone who, um, who you admire, who has been able to, so I speak to a lot of people who are just on the brink of they've just gotten their diagnosis. I'm not trained, but I, it's just helping guide them through like, here's the books that you want to read. Here are some things that you want to in, um, engage in. Routine, and, but I have a problem with routine because ADHD people don't have routine because it's driven by dopamine or driven by the day or whatever, however, but it's almost the thing that they need to create and I think Jude made a really good point. He picked the areas where he needs discipline. There is quite a link between ADHD and anxiety, especially when it has to do with right. starting new projects. Yeah. You know, this, am I am I going to start it on time? Am I going to accomplish it? Am I going to finish it within that stipulated yeah. time? And that's two weeks and procrastination. And then they've asked you to do this thing in two weeks or one day, and you're looking at yourself like, yeah. Wow, now I have to rally. Yeah, so so for for many people that that anxiety could be crippling. For for many people living with ADHD, that anxiety yeah. could be crippling. Yeah. So I think that explains when you say that you you hate last minutes, but you find yourself being a, being a last minute person mm. because for for a while you're probably just dealing with that, and then. At a point where you're not able to collect yourself, it's there's very little time to accomplish what yeah. you have to do. Yeah. yeah, I saw I saw a meme that said, "If you want your room properly cleaned, <laughs> find an ADHD person who has an exam tomorrow." <laughs> yeah, and like, the person is cleaning their room. You're like trying to like. You know what I mean? They're spending time doing things they shouldn't, they be, shouldn't doing. be doing. You know what I mean? Focused. And sometimes we're like. I would have so many other things to do and then I decide to make him my project and he's just like oh, oh god here we go sometimes he'll indulge me but then at some point so you have to put your boundary up and be like go and do the thing that you are just, what is the thing that you're not doing right now Aiden? and I'll be like my taxes and then he's like yeah Go do, go do that. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. So um, you you were talking about coping. Like oh yeah. Um, one is um, gosh, I'll, I'll try and see if I can make a list uh, for my Instagram. But there's ADHD light. There's a number of like um, a number of um, sites on Instagram that I follow uh, quite a bit. I'll send them to Jude. Jude sends them to me. Some of them are women specific. Some of them are black black people specific. What we don't have is one on Africa. There will be one soon because I will be doing that. Um, but specific to cultural environments um, in Africa as well. Um, and then, so that's Instagram as well, which is very helpful. You can go on there. Give yourself time because tell yourself you're going to look on for 30 minutes because Instagram can just send you wherever. Mm -hmm. um, there is a book called um, uh, women with ADHD. It's by Sari Soldan. So Sar Dr. Sari Soldan is a, one of the most amazing minds on ADHD, especially as it relates to women. She has two workbooks that I've given out multiple times to people. They are like workbooks. They'll have information. You don't have to read it from cover to cover, but you can um, you can maybe look and see what um, uh, they have exercises and things in that. And then she also has almost like a Bible of ADHD um, book. I'll try and take a picture of it on my Instagram and, and share it out. Um, also, um, uh, there are um, there are groups online. There's an ADD. If you have a US card, um, like a credit card or a way to pay, there's the ADD group. AD Attitude, ADD Attitude um, magazine that is very helpful. Um, the interface isn't the greatest for people with ADHD. It's a bit distracting, but the the content there is really, really good. And they also have group like thera um, therapy and group sessions 
for high performers, people in creative industry, different sections and it's community based. So that's also another good, um, good resource. Um, and also Driven to Distraction was one of the key books that was written mm. around ADHD and most recently a book by a book called Scattered Minds, Scat Scattered Minds by Gabor. I've forgotten his the, the name, but there's a lot of resources there. What is missing is resources specifically for people of African descent and in on the in and on the continent, which we're hoping things will change. Um, I truly think and I'm very inspired by both of Jude and I's experiences and our opportunity to use our platforms to have these kinds of discussions. Yeah, yeah all can, I, can, can I say two things? Useful. Number one is, Annie has a podcast that's coming very soon, where she's going to be focusing on this. And I want everybody that's paying attention, especially because your platform is so huge, to know that if you are asking questions about this, you can find it on Annie's platform. Did I do that? Yeah, <laughs> come very soon. Uh, coming very soon. And the second thing is that is that the name of the podcast? Yeah, did, did I do I that? Because yeah. uh, you always ask yourself, I mean, did I, like, did I do that? Damn. Yes. Mm. And then the second thing is that, as we were talking about it, I, I just had a thought, I wish I'd said it earlier, which is most, most ADHD people would have very critical people in their lives. And that one of the things that really helped me that I also want to share is being your own cheerleader. So, and, and what I mean by this is that speaking to yourself in the affirmative with your voice saying you're intelligent, you're great, you're this, because, because of the challenges that you may have, people will be critical of you. And because you feel a lot that can can dip into your self-esteem. And so when I've spoken to people that are I'm like younger artists that I can see at Clarity Gigi, I'm trying to tell them, get the tool of speaking to yourself, talking, you know, I'm a handsome person, you know, things like that. Like the things you wish people would say to you, it's very likely that maybe your boss or somebody, like you're not getting the, the fertilizer you need mm. to, to, to start disciplining or whatever you know what i mean or get to ideas and that that noise can become overbearing and that what you the, the best thing you can do is to speak to yourself so those are two things i think i wanted to add the way that um people speak about themselves and speak to each other you you be mumu, you be, like yeah. you're it's very it's fun it's fun it's and fun like for the, the person saying it we laugh it off and we sort of bam, 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 bam. But I think Your that- head is just scattered. That in most, oh, yeah. most people, like we're, aha, yeah, it's a joke, but yeah. the real experience, like nobody wants, I, I, don't, I think nobody wants that. And-, yeah. and it Makes it really hard for- Especially if you're struggling. Yeah. Like one of the things I, I, I say to like people in leadership in entertainment business is that if you say to someone, you know, you, you don't like, you know, Sabi, like whatever it is, what if the person believed that about themselves and you are confirming something, you know, Fair to them? Point. So you have to be, you have to be um, 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 careful about that. One one time, Annie and I were having an argument. This is maybe like last year. And I said something to her. I was trying to get a score of points. And there was something she was working on and she wasn't maybe feeling the most confident at the time. And I said it, I did without knowing, it was just a statement. And she was like, wow, that thing really, affected how I feel about this thing. And I could hear, I knew I didn't mean it, but I could see oh, I've created an impact, not, not what I want. And that's the point that a lot of people are on the receiving end of that. In the, like when I look at people that they're, they're on the receiving end of that, mm. your mom, your dad, your spouse, your brother, your sister, why can't you do this? Why can't you, blah, blah, why can't you just get this done? You should have done it this way. You should have blah, blah, blah. And that one of the things that's helped me is to get the skill of speaking to yourself every day mm -hmm. in positive terms. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm a good person. I believe in myself. I can do this. I can achieve. I can do that. I'm, you know, I'm funny. I'm blah, blah, blah. And so that you will be, um, it can really, it can really um, help you f set your mind mm -hmm. to move forward. So it's something I wanted to share with you. Know people that are watching. I think it's <laughs> phenomenal yeah. hearing that from someone like MI, right? Yeah. Like, 
Just yeah, wait. It's Us a... mere mortals must. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's really thank good. You. And I thank you for sharing thank that. You, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, I love that this conversation has been has also been eye opening for mm. me. You know, because uh, one of the one of the first reasons we started this particular platform was to help people with viewing, but also for me it's almost like a side project to also get some unlearning and relearning to build up mm. certain conditions you know it's mm. um as as medical doctors in many ways we we are trained that maybe in this part of the world to it is it is now that we're learning to treat the patient and not the disease mm. you know but um having to listen from to others and hear from their own point of view, you know, and please, we would want that podcast as soon as possible. <laughs> well, you're going to be one of my, we already have you listed as a guest, so, yeah. you know, I just haven't told you formally. Yet. Yeah, so a <laughs> um, reason being, you know, so that we can also break it down to the average woman who's on the streets who's wondering why a child isn't doing what it's called. Hopefully help a lot of people. Um, thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Thank you for sharing your perspective with us. And uh, if you're watching this, please seek help, talk to someone, and uh, we'll see you on the other side.